gentlemen, please hear from Professor Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, who was that person? Um, oh, can I use this? Okay, maybe I'll use this. Can you hear me okay? Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Quote, the water was purple black. We followed its current down the stream. This dismal watercourse descends the grayish slopes until its torrent discharges into the marsh, whose name is Styx. Inside us, we bore a city as dismal smoke. We have this black mire now to be summoned in. Unable to speak whole words, we traveled on. Through a great arc of swamp, between that sloth and the dry bank, all the while with eyes turned towards those who swallowed the buck below. And then at length, we came to a tower's base. To talk about the subject of remade is to talk about the redefinition of what is design. It's to talk about ideas of nature, ecology, communities, patience, time, recovery, stories, and storytelling, and the human spirit with that which we call landscape in all its forms, such as this expansive polluted former mining site here in northeast Oklahoma, a landscape made arduous by earlier industrial production and even more so recently by the need for climate adaptation and the search on behalf of the indigenous residents for landscape function and expression for their renewed cultural identity and equity. So the opening passage that I, that I spoke is, I hope some of you recognize, taken from an early section of Robert Pinsky's 1994 translation of Dante's Inferno, the great poem, from Canto 7, The Fourth Circle of Hell. And it's a useful parallel to the journey we're about to take this evening. I want to start with some thoughts on the arduous landscape and its origins, history, and characteristics, followed by aspects of design as they relate to these landscapes. And then finally, in the third section, uh, I want to present a graduate design studio of that name at the GSD that looks to the future of a landscape and its people with long and difficult histories and with present day social and ecological concerns towards the future. So starting with the first one, the arduous landscape. The impact of these derelict landscapes is concerning, from causing rivers to spontaneously combust, poisoning entire communities, or as shown here in this abandoned and contaminated metal plating factory in the middle of a residential district producing an unhealthy, contaminated environment. Waste from the manufacturing process, uh, process lies to the right, and the rusting machines stand idle in the center of Lanxi, L-A-N-X-I, Lanxi, this county-level city in east-central China. And this landscape demonstrates the arduous nature of sites, and yet is also a fluid term that cannot be easily characterized into one set of places, or one set of conditions, or even approaches. And in one sense, the existence of a disciplinary salon de refuse, in parenthesis, or rejected places through these landscapes suits me, as it's provided me with an academic call to work within and to work on. A landscape that should be preserved, or at least its memory, and the story of its workers and their efforts, despite the chemical pollution and after products of their efforts, is relevant today and into the future 
as it was ignored in the past. So to return to the term arduous as it may apply to these places, the definition I've used for these landscapes means, as the dictionary defines, hard, laborious, grueling, demanding, onerous, strenuous, etc., etc. It derives from the Latin ardus, A-R-D-U-U-S, which means high, steep, difficult, as applied to the slope of a hill or a mountain. So you can see the term itself, at least partly, has its origins in the landscape itself. But there's something also eerie and fascinating about abandonment such as this, the Asarco metals refining factory uh, in just outside Monterrey, Mexico, that has proven irresistible to artists, photographers, and to ecologists, landscape architects, designers, and critics of all shades. Only abandonment, it seems, are decaying walls and vegetated innards able to tell a story of a more noteworthy time, such as this, uh, an abandoned textile mill in Gerangawa, a district center of Mumbai, or formerly Bombay in India, which even manages to have a form of sublime beauty nestling in the overgrown toxic ruins. With their foreboding appearances, these places can be highly hazardous, not to be entered lightly. However, as the essayist and poet Wendell Berry has stated about images such as these, quote, anyone who troubles to identify in the pictures the things that are readily identifiable, whether they're roads or pathways, infrastructure, or in this case, fortifications in the demilitarized zone in between North and South Korea will see nothing in them that is abstract. The power of these places is in their terrifying particularity. They are the ways and the results of human presence and work. And if some of the results are abstract or unlike anything we've seen before, it is because nobody foresaw or because nobody cared what they would look like. Again, a detail of the abandoned Asarco metals refining site in Mexico, they are consequences of working without imagination, without affection, without heart. And Wendell Berry continues, quote, and this has been reflected in our cultural and artistic efforts to pray, portray the destructive force of such places, and at the same time the spirit and the need for their survival and multiple ideas of discovery and importantly, redemption. The subject matter of, for example, the Russian director, one of my favorites, Andrei Tarkovsky's 1979 classic film, Stalker where the star post-nuclear one industrial landscape, in his terms, the so-called dead zone, is seen as the leftovers of humankind that are carelessly tossed aside, yet at the same time a holder or a place of genuine mystery beyond our human understanding, where there's an ethereal slippage between the earth and the divine. It's also a source of intense power and faith and knowledge where nature and man lie down together in the, in the unity of location and time. Now, incidentally, for shooting this film, Tarkovsky used authentic industrial landscape sites, a deserted hydro power plant on the Jigawa River and the abandoned flora chemical factory, both located in Estonia. I would urge you to go and see this film, by the way, Stalker by Tarkovsky. Now, industrial lands are not just a result of present societal forces and climate and technological processes out of balance. Here, in the late 19th century, alongside the eroded banks of the contaminated Scrooge River, in center Philadelphia, and though Penn graduates here will recognize the Schuylkill River, that factories developed its wealth, the wealth of the city, 
Work all day and night to produce manufactured goods, raw iron, steam locomotives, textiles, and felt hats. And the field of landscape architecture, at least in the United States, has evolved from these roots in the 19th century to continue to address pressing issues of the built and the natural environment. And there are two parallel strands of advocacy that had their roots in the progressive era at the beginning of the 20th century. One was equity, that term again, equity in public health, or what was called sanitary reform, dedicated to cleaning up the squalid urban conditions of workers, particularly in relationship to work and housing. And the other, the almost opposite, was the conservation movement, which was dedicated to preserving and enhancing America's open spaces and wildlife. This is Yosemite uh, waterfall. And the two strands were born much earlier during the late 19th century in reaction to unbridled urbanization. So today, designers, particularly landscape architects, particularly landscape architects, are facing up to the latter public health or sanitary reform seen through the lens of hazardous sites, contamination, waste, climate adaptation, and equity as the missing link in an approach to the contemporary landscape environment that has so often favored the former, the conservation of spaces in wildlife. So in part two, I want to introduce how design, and particularly landscape architectural design, has intersected with this arduous landscape and has evolved in time uh, to the involvement with larger global sites. There has been early promising starts in the name of public health and what was called the sanitary movement that have not been well studied. Uh, consider, for example, on the left, these paired photographs, you know, before, after, top, bottom. These are from 1920, okay? And the caption, they're taken in the Bronx, New York, and the top of the caption reads, pollution and obstruction above botanical gardens, and below, after view. And on the right, reading at the top, garbage dump in foreground, and below from the same viewpoint. And it's interesting, in both of these issues, both of these prices, again from the 1920s, covering up and returning to, let's call it, a kind of pastoral scene is very noticeable in, in both the situations. But again, this is back in 1920. This is over 100 years ago. Now, so Peter Hall, in his classic book, Cities and Civilization, defined a number of ages, golden ages, in the evolution of us, society, that he termed maybe civic or urban. For example, the classical centers of ancient Rome and Athens, the innovative milieu of technology and economics, such as this, which was, believe it or not, Manchester, England, um, industrial manufacturing landscape, shown here in this 1955, oil painting by L.S. Lowry in the Tate Britain Gallery in London that Louise and I, my wife and I, saw uh, just this summer. But now we're looking at another age. I'm going to call, call it the post-industrial order. Probably not as Hall imagined or viewed a golden age, but an age nonetheless. And accounts of these landscapes derive mainly from the public recording of cities with their toxic landfills, polluted wetlands, polluted rivers, uh, and abandoned factory landscapes. This one here, for example, is in northwest Mexico City, the former Penex oil refinery site. And these sites don't indicate just a change in the physical appearance of land or waterways, or a or a simple return to the productive use of exhausted or undervalued developed lots of land. This is in Pink Show, China, uh, which is kind of a tidying up of, of the past industrial environment. But it signals a profound shift in the way in which citizens must lay claim to this disputed land, and that the academy, such as here, should teach and carry out research. Uh, this mining site is 10 miles by 4 miles, just so you can see it. It's quite large. I've included in this slide some of the 20 books or reports that document my research and teaching from probably 98 onwards 
on this topic, mostly on the subject, not all, but mostly on the subject of largest landscapes and the role of landscape architecture and design in, in this regard. And many of these initiatives and investigations focus on the issues of soil, air, and groundwater pollution, and have to take account that pollutants through previous industrial activities need remediation at both a local, as a micro, and also regional scale. And one technique within landscape architecture is phytotechnologies that describe mechanisms by which living plants alter the chemical composition of the soil matrix in which they're growing. This, is, for example, in the form of a wastewater treatment complex in Seoul, uh, South Korea. But it's also a set of planning, engineering, design, and cultural practices that assist landscape architects, engineers, and planners in working on these individual sites, district-scale landscapes, and larger regional territories as an alternative to environmental engineering approaches. This, again, is being show It's the next pit down another 10 miles by 4 miles, which has been regenerated. So I think to, to kind of demonstrate this uh, approach, I want to really present one studio I've worked on in the last 25 years at Harvard that illustrates the strategies of integrating remediation as aspects of design intervention and cultural investment over time. Now, I worked on a few. For example, this one was in 2018. Titled Career Remade. Now you'll first of all start to see that I put remade at the end of every title. So this is Career Remade. Uh, this was with landscape architects Young Moon Kim and Yoon Jin Park of, of Park Kim on the 250 kilometer uh, demilitarized zone called the DMZ between North and South Korea. The site is heavily mined. Actually, three million landmines are already still on the site, and polluted yet, at the same time, ecologically rich, and guarded on either side by two large hostile armies. You know, it's a pretty straightforward landscape. What unites the two sides of this four kilometer wide landscape is the adjacent fabric of the underlying soils, the hydrologic systems, and the vegetation that weave across this peninsula. Or indeed, on Mumbai remade, so you start to kind of understand how this works, um, in the Maharashtra province on the western flank of the country, a wet, tropical, dense city of 12.5 million residents, prone to monsoon floods and rainfalls, intense daily air pollution, contaminated rivers, and an overwhelming social structure. It sounds a little bit like Bangkok, but it's actually not. 60% um, of this city have no formal housing. Uh, I mean, they live on the streets. Um, they don't have constant water supply or basic sanitation. And these railway corridors, this is a, a working corridor, this is not an abandoned corridor, uh, are home for many street dwellers and families where children under the age of two have a 50% chance of survival. But I want to talk about this. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on this one case study. A graduate design studio I carried out in 2021-2022, so it's a fairly recent title, Tar Creek Remade, uh, Environmental Legacies and the Reimagining the Future of the Tar Creek Superfund Site located in the state of Oklahoma, USA. So tonight I want to just show you a case study that is not about Bangkok. It's actually about uh, a site that may not be familiar with you um, and hopefully it might trigger your interest in these types of sites. Now, let's see. The site imagined alternative futures for the making of this. It is the oldest largest and most dangerous polluted land in the United States. It's oldest, largest, and most polluted, okay? And the site itself is named for the subsidiary Tar Creek, which flows in the middle here, and consists of a series of former mining industries 
waste areas, tribal communities, by tribal I mean indigenous communities, um, and towns with roughly about, a very small, 30,000 population in this area. It's located in, as the red arrow shows, in the northeast corner of the state of Oklahoma. And that shows where Oklahoma is, it's sort of in the middle bit. Okay, we are at Boston, it's way up here in Massachusetts. It's home to the Quapaw Nation, Q-U-A-P-A-W, Quapaw, uh, which is uh, a nine other Native American and non-tribal communities, including Cherokee. This is probably one that's more commonly known. And the land is classified as a Superfund site. That is a, a, a governmental name uh, given to an environmental program established in the 1980s by the U.S. federal government to address hazardous waste sites with intensity of pollution and scale of devastation. Unfortunately now, people forget the term uh, related to the act and to the program, and they just talk about the site as a Superfund site. And so this studio explored technologies of toxic landscape reclamation and our agency recovered our environmental but also social inequities uh, within the practices of landscape architecture and design. And these include the poisoning of local children and the elderly by lead waste. This area was lead mining. In fact, it was the largest lead mining in the world. And the ethnic genocide, and I use that very deliberately, the genocide, the systemized killing of indigenous residents along with the attempted removal of their customs and culture. So this is where design not only addresses the nature of what you see in front of you, but it has to also address the social and cultural conditions that have existed, currently exist, and might exist in the future. Though, and through this, to give form and detail to the creation of a design language for the remediation of this red acidic water, contaminated air, soil, sediments, all set within the repair and making the region abandoned by the mining industry 50 years ago, actually in the 1970s, and the resulting riverways and communities they left behind. That is not an altered photograph. That actually is the color of the, of the creek. Working closely with the residents and the tribal advocate, this is Rebecca Jim of Cherokee Nation, shown here. She is an advocate, she's an environmental, she's not a scientist, but she works with communities to understand environmental issues. She actually also was a high school uh, teacher. The studio, the design studio, developed alternative design futures on behalf of the Kopar Nation living on and in the vicinity of Tar Creek. And the studio also asked the fundamental question, which I, I pose to all of you, particularly students, right now. How can landscape architects, or indeed uh, any designer, work effectively in cultures that are not their own, with respect and deference for others' values, ways of life, and different attitudes to land, landscape, and resources? So the occupation and historic ownership of the land and landscape is complex to say the least. It would take actually another two lectures just to explain it, but I'll try and sort of summarize it. Um, the site is again the Red Arrow, that's Oklahoma, this is of course the East Coast, Florida, Texas. Following the forced relocation from the southeastern uh, uh, United States of Native Americans, these are Native American tribes, between 1830 and 1850, and this map attempts to show the, the trans, how the tribes were moved, the trails that they were taken uh, forcibly by the military. 
because the land in which they occupied their ancestral land was being taken by the government. So they were forced to move. And the Cherokee and up to nine other tribes were moved to a reserve in about the mid 1800s at enormous cost to human life. Uh, the the uh, appalling migration of women, children, and sick on foot and horseback during the harsh winter months. Uh, they lost 60% of the tribe by death on the way, called the Trail of Tears and disruption to deep social and cultural ties to their ancestral land. Again, this is just the context. And this included, again, the Red Arrow, the smaller Quopaw Nation, who were forcibly removed from Arkansas, their homelands to northeast Oklahoma. And this map here shows the official survey of Native American tribes in 1874, uh, by the government with boundaries wh which don't actually make sense, uh, very sharp boundaries between the tribes, although the tribes moved across these boundaries. Uh, and they're attempting to fix and isolate each tribe within a piece of land, which is completely against their culture because they hunt and move across the land. I want to show you by contrast what I mean. This looks like a map you all can kind of understand. There's a plan, there's the different areas, the different zones. This is how the tribe sees it. This is one of their, it's not a drawing, you could argue it's a painting on buffalo hide. And it is attempting to describe the location of three villages, not just by their geographical location, with earth pigments on this height, but actually the idea of their inter-social relationship uh, with overlapping boundaries based on hunting, fishing, farming, and their complex social organization. The, the two images, for example, in the middle are very important. It's the sun and the moon, and the moon is part of their origin story. The moon, which is female, had a daughter, and she fell through the clouds to earth, and she bore two children, the good child and the bad child. And that is the, for example, the, the good child made the rose, the bad child made the thorns on the rose. And the, the, good, the good child made the snake, the bad child made the bite of the snake. It goes on and on and on. But this is the origin of their tribe through storytelling. And you see it there. It's quite interesting because it's actually flattened perspective, if you want to use it from a go quite a bit of fold back the perspective. And the local tribe maintains strong alliances to these cultural traditions through ceremonial dress and regalia. They do the longest running powwow, which is a kind of a, a, a gathering of tribal members for dance and for competitions and for really showing off with each other uh, in early July. Ironically, July the 4th, which is sort of interesting that they have the powwow the same as the uh, as a national holiday in the US. And more spatial aspects of the Kropar tribe cultural events will be shown here with the private uh, powwow gathering ground on, on the right. They do drumming and dancing. I was not, I'm not allowed to, to go there as, as a non-Native American. I, I'm not allowed to go there and, and watch it. I can simply go to the grounds when it's up there. And on the left is actually bison calves. Uh, bison, you know, the type of large animal which they used to have, being reintroduced back into the community as a central part of their livelihood as a food source and spiritual practices. Uh, they were almost made extinct uh, back in the 1880s, where 50 million were slaughtered, uh, not for their meat, they're just slaughtered to actually as a form of genocide. So the study area is one part of what is called the, the Tri-State Mining District. It's located in Kansas, which is to the top left, Missouri, and Oklahoma, and you see the states come together at one point, right on the corner there. Um, the site area is about 40 square miles, 
of about 25,600 acres, uh, 103 square kilometers, and with a subsidiary Tar Creek that starts in Kansas and goes through. And Tar Creek gives the name to the study. The tribal land was formerly characterized as tall grass prairie and woodlands prior to activity of mining that started in the 1900s, following the discovery of the largest lead and zinc deposits in the world. And lead uh, it was very important, particularly for manufacturing uh, weapons and for the military. And this is actually the same site after 1900. And Completely occupied by a so mini town, a miners. No Native Americans were, were allowed to mine. They lived on the land, they did not own what was below the land. And the rights were sold to white manufacturers, uh, white, white uh, companies, companies of not named to mine. But as you'll see, they inherited something else. So the study of it has been impacted by over 120 years of environmental landscape degradation that has created and continues to create significant health impacts because the Native Americans were left the waste for the mining, not the wealth. The wealth in 1918, uh, the annual cost or the value of the ore that came out was 110 million US dollars. And it was remarkable when they lived in it back then. So there was incredible wealth on their land, but they didn't inherit any of it. They inherited the waste, which you can still see today. But it has, again, created significant health impacts, as well as cultural and spiritual harm to the community. So the site is complicated because of the waste, and the problems and substance that threaten the environment. Flooding is a, is a potential problem that can bring waste to the river, which is toxic and influences water bodies downstream. And the groundwater uh, discharges empties into the creek, which crows uh, a pollution loop. Quite simply says, nine million gallons of water come out of the abandoned mine every day, carrying with it metals, which go into the rivers, which then flow through the communities creating that red color, by the way. So, the hypothesis underlying the studio for the students is that the remediation of the post-mining landscape under the leadership and management of the tribal community. That's very important. Um, the cost for the cleanup of this site, according to the US government, is 54 billion US dollars. But that that's, uh, it's such a <laughs> ridiculous logic about it, it will never happen. And so there have been smaller projects done by outside contractors, all of which either were, were negligent, corruption, uh, was wrong, or they failed. And what we have proposed is the tribal community educate themselves in remediation as environmental consultants. So the money now is going directly to the doing projects like this, which is a massive passive cleaning system. Uh, this is a test, this is not the final thing. This is an experiment on the site to cleanse the water in the Mile Ranch near the town of Commerce in the Superfund area. But there are three key questions and I pose them to you and they're quite useful actually for other types of sites and other sort of projects. But the first one is, and I'm directly talking to the students here. How can the evolution of your conceptual design be supported and advanced by the concerns of remaking as you define it? How does the landscape in Tar Creek structure the changing needs of scientific, culture, cultural, and aesthetic core knowledge? We are in a library just now. What type of knowledge do we need to work on these sites? Are they contained in books here? Or is a new type of book, a new type of writing, a new type of research that needs to be carried out? Again, I just pose this question. And then finally, 
What is your interpretation of remade or landscape remade and recovery? And how can your study approach the surrounding landscape to consider a regional, i.e. concrete, a national, U.S., or even a global model? And so these are the questions that were posed on how each of the students' projects were, were kind of, as it were, evaluated. How they addressed each of these questions. Some quite well, some not quite so well, some would answer one, but not another. But anyway, more of that. So, class members working individually pursued a range of design and environmental engineering proposals at different scales of operation, culminating in a detailed landscape design proposal which addressed potential programs of agriculture, energy, and other industries for making a site that is culturally, ecologically, and spatially innovative, yet also pragmatic are you able to be done? So the land and the repair and the ecology of the region has been devastated, as you've seen so far, by acid mine drainage, micro dust in the air, sapling ponds and sinkholes and former mine shafts that together have created complex patterns of land substance and poisonous aerial waters affecting buildings, infrastructure, open space, and of course people. So, as we've seen, following the of lead, zinc, and cadmium underground, a vast mining operation employing 11,000 non local workers in 250 mills started in 1900. And due to the complex ownership of land by tribal land, the leases that were devised here, as I said, excluded the, the tribal members. And his history then, and the horrific legacy arising from the mining and the milling, have really been kept from public view. Although, ironically, the mountains of mining waste, which are called chat, C-H-E-T, like top, chat, these are chat piles, are very highly visible. The irony is kept hidden, but you can see them all. So, mining activities gradually declined from 1950 to 1968 until the closure of most of the mines and the mining companies left the area. The pumping of mines to keep them dry stock, as I said, leading to about 9 million gallons a day, filling the rooms and bubbling to the surface. And then the land is occupied now by the remaining towns of Kopa, Commerce, and Miami. And two other towns, picture, and this one is called Cardin, C-A-R-D-I-N. These have been disincorporated and abandoned because they're too toxic to live in. But the most striking visual evidence and the thing that, of course, my landscape students always gravitate toward is the proliferation of the waste mountains. They call them mountains. Of soil. Or chat parts of the landscape. This is a uh, contrast to the flat prairie land of the county when the sculpted by rain and wind to take on the appearance of natural outcropping. So, for example, on the left there, that is not natural at all. That is sand waste sculpted by rain, by wind, into what look like natural rock formations. It's quite unusual. They're also now a home to the bird that likes the nest. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite complex. Um, and the chat piles spread throughout the site. They're up to about two feet high, and they act as a source of, of airborne red microbus particles that pervade the area. Now, the ore, again, this is all part of our research was originally mined using what's called wooden pillar mining techniques. So when I showed this China project, that was an open pit, just a massive area that was excavated. Here, uh, the, the analogy I use, if, if you know what a, a, a German um, black forest case is, you know, you've got sponge, you've got jam, you've got cream, sponge, and you go down vertically to the cream, and then you go out horizontal. You take away all the cream, then you go down again to the next layer. Because I'm going to say to you, okay, hard. if you take away all the cream, the whole thing will just start dropping. So every 50 feet, you leave a pillar. 
And so the whole place is this kind of network of what we call rooms, pillars and rooms. Um, let's see. The maximum depth of the mining was about 385 feet below the ground. And so what you have, again, hopefully you can read it. This is a USGS map, and they've actually plotted the extent of these rooms. And because it doesn't follow the logic of you know, Cartesian geometry. It doesn't follow, and it follows the logic of the geology, the ore. So you go where the ore is. And on top, if you look very, very closely, again, I apologize, it's a little washed out, are actually towns on, on top of these. And the towns are more in relationship to the Cartesian, the, the Jeffersonian grid, north, south, east, west. And so in many cases, the towns are sitting on room space underneath. And so these are quite large. I was told by a very, very old miner in Oklahoma, you could go down the mine and walk to Kansas underground. It's, it was so interconnected, this a honeycomb. And again, as a landscape architect, or as a planning type, this is the kind of knowledge, that when you do a site analysis, this is the site you're studying, you know? And, and you can't really see this stuff. Now, oh. There we go. Mining waste, as I said, was piled up on the surface from the star. And chat, which is a fine sand-like material, contains heavy metals, lead, zinc, and mostly cadmium, which are dangerous to humans and non-humans alike. And an inventory conducted in 2005 identified 83 piles and 83, 243 bases occupying about 2,846 acres which is three, three times the size of Central Park, New York, just to give you some, some sense of scale, with an estimated volume of 37.7 million cubic yards. All of you, right now, in this room, have lead in your body. You actually need it as part of your growth there from a child. You have about nine to ten parts, okay? The children in this area have up to 45. So they have almost four, four or four and a half times lead in their body. And if you know anything about lead, lead affects uh, brain development, it affects actually um, muscular and motor development. Uh, it also is a relationship between the amount of lead and the number of IQ points you have, how you score in tests. And so it's actually very, very uh, vital that lead does not get into young children, particularly older people, seniors but that this is indeed what happened. And during, I said, mining operations, the, the gallons of water would pump from the mines to keep them dry. And so you have this type of color. In fact, I, probably the color is not good on this projection, but it's actually more, it's kind of like your seat. Well, some of you are sitting on, on Tar Creek seats, you know, it's sort of orange colored seats. It's that kind of color, with a bit more red in it. Maybe like your, your sweater, the t-shirt, yeah, sports. So that, that's the sort of hard to look at measure, okay? Now, you're thinking, oh God, this is just so terrible, you know, how, how, much, how much worse can this get? <laughs> um, it can get much worse, actually. Uh, because the mining ended, guess what happened? Rogue miners went underground and started mining the pillars which still contained ore, and they did them completely illegally. They got out, of course, by mining the pillars, then the mine started to drop, the, the so-called, you know, black forest cake started dropping. And now, today, land opens up like this, at, with, with no warning. Um, across roads, homes, open land. I've seen actually places where literally one day it's flat, the next day it's like this. There's a there's a powerful story of a farmer who told me that he used to have a, an outhouse. An outhouse is a very polite word for an outside toilet. Okay, um, that had an electric light that was connected to his home, 
and he suddenly heard a massive noise one night in the dark. And he went out and his own house, his toilet, had gone. And he went to the edge of his garden and he looked down and his toilet, with the, the outhouse, was swinging on the electric light four or five hundred, uh, forty feet down in the, in the hole. So that's more kind of humorous and sort of amusing, but actually it can be much more serious than it's wrote. So in Ottawa County, Ottawa County is a county in which Tar Creek sits. Untreated water carrying high levels of metal drain uh, southward into the Neosha and the Grand River and increased flux of that toxic flooding upstream of the lake backed up all the way into Miami. And interventions by FEMA had to address the destruction of tribal housing next to the river. Again, I'm just telling you how it's going to get worse. Everything uh, is laying this on to you, you know. Um, and so the studio addressed how landscape site design and environmental engineering can address the social, ecological, environmental realities of this toxic terrain. And these sub-themes, legacy, origins, which is really talking about what I'm talking to you about, where this comes from, the legacies, which are environmental and health related, wisdom. This is the wisdom both in terms of what design brings, but also indigenous wisdom of how they live there, how they live on the land, how they farm on the land, and then of course futures, which looks forward. If field trip to the study area took place, my class made daily visits to the site in vans, cars, on food. They met the council of, of elders. This is uh, two students on top of one of the chant piles. And afterwards, when they come off, they have to um, put their boots in a bath and hose them down, including shaking their clothes. I don't tell GSD this too much, you know, uh, for, for liability reasons. They also met with the tribal elders, county officials, local farmers, and families. But our main contact is actually Rebecca, Rebecca Jen here, uh, who founded a local, uh, they call it a non-profit, uh, called LED, or L-E-A-D, Local Environmental Action. It's very cute, but it, it's led or lead. And who coordinates the residents and the representatives of the tribal and the county agencies. So, we've had a kind of long wind up. I'm going to show you some of the student projects, okay? Uh, just because of a sense of how they tackle the studio. They struggle with the studio. This is, this is not easy stuff, okay? So, um, I, I actually put the pictures up there. The first project is, is um, called Restoring Down Screen, um, a Tar Creek Landscape Plan for Community Water at Ali Khan. Uh, and Jackie Ali Khan is from, uh, he's actually uh, Pakistani, but from Toronto. And uh, Jackie is from Shanghai. Okay, so you can get the sense. Um, Cobalt tribal communities have always been associated with land defined by water. The name Cobalt itself translates in English to downstream people. And water is a central part of their indigenous identity. Water never is a symbol of the larger condition of this landscape after decades of extractive mining. And their project speaks not only to Ali Khan and Jackie's repair and rehabilitation of this polluted and dying hydrologic system, but to the river's role as a sustainable economic vector. The red color of the water, the killing of aquatic wildlife and land and staining, is also on oxide metals uh, and heavy metals released from the mines. But as the project first moved forward, they decided to ascribe legal rights of environmental personhood to Tar Creek. And this uh, kind of builds on work that has been done in New Zealand, Ecuador, India, and Canada. You're giving a, an environmental system, in this case a river, legal rights in court. Even in its current polluted state, as a living entity, so if you pollute it, you can be taken to court by the river. It's, I know it sounds a little ridiculous, but this is actually uh, legally correct. 
And it lays out actually you know, the history of this idea of legal rights in rivers around the world. And Rebecca Jim and her organization are currently doing this. They filed the paperwork for Tar Creek to have legal rights. And so, you know, the project advances a holistic revitalization revitalization plan for several of the small towns along Tar Creek. The riparian zone and critical corridors of territorial scale for keystone species, animals, birds, insects, and microorganisms, of course, as well as people. And three points were selected along the river, uh, rooms of left to right, land remediation on site one, acute integration on site two, and then education and research on site three. And then for each, uh, they de develop a set of landscape tools, like a kind of kit of parts, to be used across the site individually or in combinations at the three key development points. Um, I, I won't necessarily go through every single image, but fire stabilization, fire radiation, active water treatment plant, and an acid mining system similar to the Maya Ranch construction that I showed earlier. And top left is a painting of the original character of this land. It's uh, a town settlement by American artist and soldier Seth Eastman, who lived from about 1808 to 1875, who documented this top left one, tribal landscapes as a record of their lives and customs. And so the three remaining, remaining images uh, by Ali Khan and Jackie continue to explore Seth Eastman's vision of the Oklahoma wilderness and tribal lands and demonstrate how Tar Creek and Copal might evolve over time. And I'm going to have to tell you this, that two of the images were produced by AI. But I know that. In other words, be careful with the money. Second project. Uh, this is Holly, yeah. Uh, leave the unseen, how long study explores the role of microorganisms in landscapes and biogeochemical recycling. So we saw this with something very large. She actually went down to the microbial level. In this habitat, uh, microbes are invisible as living agencies, but represent a significant portion of biodiversity and biomass in the soils and play key roles in sustainable ecosystem remediation. Thus, hidden from view, we have been seen, um, in interwoves networks of random habitats into a system of connected patches. So human activity and risk influences how agencies, particularly governmental, consider to shape the ground surface of Tar Creek. Yet from the view of non-human agents, plants, insects, microbacterial fungi, the contaminated blue soils will have a suburban catalog of resources for them. And when the mining ceased in the early 1970s, loaded active pumping of millions of gallons of water out of the mines. The mines flooded and reacted with the oxidized and uh, leftover reactive heavy metals and drained into Tar Creek, critically damaging the soils, resources, uh, and aquatic life. And on the left map, is downstream of Tar Creek and Ocean River, the city of Miami. Uh, the main discharge of 110,400 cubic feet per second generates flooding to the residential, tribal, and northeast Oklahoma in and college facilities shown on the right hand map. And yet, the mycelium in the proposed new soil condition evolves as terrestrial and aquatic yeasts, symbiotic patterns of larkins and fungi. Following an influence on the soil structure, soil chemistry, and plant growth by balancing the pH, enriching soil nutrition, and setting up a remediation buffer. So the concept is to build up a biomembrane at different scales, weaving a new landscape structure that is hidden and visible to the human eye. And this ecological system integrates the water system human experience in subterranean network for the purposes of flood control, radical remediation, and creation of spaces for public gathering. 
Um, this is the, the detailed section of the, the plaza and the last image next to the college campus. So the landscape is restored and reshaped for relaxation, prayers, and contemplation of nature in the spiritual world. And this hidden subterranean network is integrated within the daily practices of the resident tribal members in the Kopa tribe who continue to fight for their tribal rights and environmental resilience. Last part, I'm getting that, don't worry. So the final student project in Blanco, above the long ground roots, resuming old agricultural plants and food waste for a new biofuel industry by Wei Kuan Chen, who's from Beijing, explores how to transform pollution into a power of healing that can compensate tribal and non-tribal people spiritually and materially. So known as an agricultural tribe, the world war is to transfer e traditional economic, ecological knowledge about caring for the land to obtain food security between generations, and it was actually transferred orally. However, in 1900, the mining transformed these and uh, sites their land into a toxic lunar scape. So mines replaced the prairie landscape with bison, fields of grain and vegetables, and small residential villages. And those injuries to the natural resource had severe impacts on the local food system, leading to food insecurity. By the way, they couldn't grow enough food to feed themselves. So this became the kind of basis of the project. She developed a biofuel industry which generated economic benefit with fire remediation functions to clean the political lands in order to develop more food production, forming a farm food energy cycle. And the whole system provides sustainable revitalization of, of the ecology, of the economy, and the social culture of the site in two parts. After removing the basics of the chat, Biofuel plant crops are planted with fire extraction functions to clean the fields for food production. And then second, fire stabilization crops are mixed with traditional food crops. They call it there the three sisters, which is corn, beans, and squash. And each of them works with the next, provides the, as it were, the, the food for the one that follows. And then regenerative grazing will follow us the harvest of the food crops, particularly by bison. So the rehabilitating in chat piles become the route for new industries that can invigorate the local economy and provide a livable landscape for the reconstruction in the end of a tall grass prairie interspersed with a kind of viable productive farming. So under the grandmother room from the origin story, um, tribal and non-tribal people convene together on the power ground surrounded by traditional food crops and biofuel crops, uh, providing a new economy and a healthier land for the native above below ground roots to thrive. So Rebecca June not only went on a field trip from students, we were actually visiting the design school uh, on the right for our final reviews, which is always very nice to take her out of contact to the GSD. And then following the completion of the course, three forms of the Garden Chandler. First, we published a book, which I always do, on the studio. Uh, secondly, we had a public exhibition uh, in the school. Uh, the sheet here, which actually was bought in a sort of Woolworth sort, it was dipped in Tar Creek by one of the students and then brought back on the airplane uh, to Cambridge. Um, and then I attended the, the Tar Creek the annual conference um, uh, in 2022, Aspirations for Restoration, and presented the project back to the community. <coughs> so I want to return to a topic that's significant to Tar Creek and landscapes in the future the sources of design ideas as they relate to arduous sites. There is a persistent moral strain which has continued to inform design practice in present times. The medium of a landscape that you work with, possibly in studio, is considered natural. 
and therefore lays a claim to a moral status of truth that places it in an oppositional relationship to the cultural artifice and the true condition of these post-industrial arduous lands. But even the most cursory analysis of these sites reveals industrial and artificially manipulated surfaces. In fact, the site with which that's an architect works for this <coughs> becomes a part of it. It's actually fiction. So here, the moral superiority assigned to landscape design by appealing to the natural needs to be questioned. Um, and so by looking observably, without trite moralizing at the natural world, as well as the disposable world, we can build a the between the two, which suggests a new model of how we have to work within our environment. So new quality of attention to the intricate organic and artificial reality, looking beyond nostalgia for the impossibly pristine. For example, the tall respirator can never be recovered completely and clear sighted beyond disgust for the actual present conditions. I want to take it back to from the underworld. So we're going to return to Dante, the poet, and his ascent going back up from the inferno. To get back up to the shining world from where my guide and I goes into that hidden tunnel. And following his path have to do care to rest, but climb on. He first starts and I so far. Through a round of rapture, I saw it here. Some of the most beautiful things that heaven and there is. When we came forth, and once saw, once more saw the star of God. Thank you for your attention. Um, when you see some of this stuff, you think, oh, well, it's in Mexico, it's in India, it's in Oklahoma, and therefore it doesn't make much One thing to think about, particularly in Thailand, Thailand now is the largest importer of e-waste in the world. Mostly in north of Bangkok, is the industrial where the e-waste, i.e. waste from things like this, your cell phones, um, it used to go to China, China banned it, it goes to Ghana and to Thailand, and it's highly toxic, and it's just, the industry is just north of this city. So don't think you can escape these types of landscapes. Um, they're in every country, just some are more known than others, like Chernobyl in, in Ukraine, uh, the mining sites in China, but there are similar sites. I can find a site anywhere in the world, in any country. That, I'm just throwing it out to you, just to kind of, you could say, oh well, it doesn't involve me. Okay. Hello. In fact, what uh, Professor Kirkman is, true, because it's not the kind of nation what we have here in the sense that he is abandoned, contaminating, or you know, using a forgotten land. On the project of this site, we can look at our own countries, our own cities. For example, a land underneath the red uh, highway that passed through Mecca. This is the same principle. And the last habitat that we practice today, in fact, we look at the landscape maybe two million things on the skin and the face. Some of the samples over here have been the projects that have like an underground, underground hollow throughout the states, right? 
and this created land that sunk him right away. This is the way to look at the landscape in sections. You can think something deeper than two meters of the garden or surface. In this aspect, in fact, we have so many things like Professor Kraku said, he can look at the project like this anywhere. So I encourage our landscape like that today because uh, this is a good sample so that we can see our world expanding rather than designing a beautiful landscape on the surface. Right? Uh, anyone have some ideas about this? Or anyone want to express? You don't have to ask any questions. No. You can talk about your experience and sharing this in these lectures. Okay, thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, Mr. Tapswood. I'm, I'm a former landscape architect. I'm a student here. But currently, I'm working in the develop, like a kind of a developers. Um, seeing your lecture is really, a really um, quite great knowledge and experience. And, and what reminds me is that when we're talking about the landscape architect and landscape design, we think about how we cope or how we deal with a piece of land like this. But in terms of the developers, I'm also a landscape architect, but being in a developing like, um, ecosystem, um, what is your like, cautions, or what is your like, advice to reminding the developers <coughs> not to end up a project mm -hmm. like this? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, let, let me quickly tell you a very, very short story. Um, because I, I show these sites, I show these places, and people say, oh, and then, then you have in the end the slide and everything you know, cleaned up, and everything is like this before and after slides and from the 20s. And I say, no, no, these are, are incredibly long projects. Um, Rebecca Jim has the, one of the answers. I ask her quite often. I've been working on this site in 2001 already. Uh, and then quite a long time, although it's still quite short time. I say, how long will you get the Guapar tribe, how long will it take to clean up most of the chat, the river, etc.? And her answer was 200 years. So within the indigenous communities, they have a much longer time scale that they're able to see. Of course, after her passing and her generation to their grand. <clears throat> but she is confident that in about 200 years, now maybe other parts of the United States will have changed completely, but the indigenous tribe will be there, will have the prairie, will be hunting buffalo in some form. So to answer directly your question, which is the idea of time is very important. Developers and development usually operates in very short windows, 15 to 20 years, and then it changes again. So number one is think of the site 25 years, 50 years, 100 years. I think it's possible to do that. The second thing, think about the cultural condition. You are not going to find indigenous tribal communities living on your sites, but you might find other cultural connections, particularly with the history of Thailand, the history of Siam, that are important to, to evoke and to keep and to work on. So I think the wonderful thing about working with tree, working with vegetation, particularly trees, is that uh, here I know they grow very, very fast because of the climate, but you know, plant, plant trees, plant vegetation for the next hundred years. They can do cleanup, they can do uptake, they can establish communities. They're certainly going to address increases in temperature, climate adaptation. So I think you have to, it's, it's not a very easy formula. It's not as though there's one thing, you just tell them that and everything is going to change. But I think start to get them to think about the site after the development project you're doing is actually taken down. <laughs> What's going to happen next? And that actually will both terrify them, frighten them, but I actually might provoke them. Okay? And that's what is so wonderful about the field of landscape architecture, 
is that you're really not designing for this family. You're designing for two generations like that. And I think that is extra strength and beauty. The day of building is open. And I also turn to the market there. The day of building is open and starts to break down. The day a landscape opens is very juvenile. It might take 20, 25 years when you see the photograph. So that, 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 try that on me, okay? <laughs> yeah, is it personal? Ah, oh, okay. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Professor. I think one of the reasons that we didn't ask, or we didn't know how to ask, it might be because the subject was beyond comprehension. It's like much better as the at first as the landscape architect. We didn't know that our role can do any change on that. Um, I think we are all well aware that Thailand is one of the countries that have those problems where the e-junk is in office. Just last year, somebody stole the radioactive piece from the factory and sold it to the scratch shop, for example. Or the ruining problems of the corridor being chopped up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as we are speaking now, and hundreds of millions of people down the river will like, face the, the impact. And then we look back at the role of the landscape, your um, students that um, did the work not just as the landscape actually, but uh, they have to be biologists, they have to be scientists, mm -hmm. and incorporate all those knowledge. And, and one of the hopes that I can get uh, from, from, from their work is that um, if you don't do it, who will do? Because mm -hmm. we are the one who um, have to do with, with the subject, with the physical things of the landscape, especially the, the abandoned one, which I don't um, the example of the communal is because you know, politics, big businesses, you know, uh, energy businesses join together, uh, capitalism, greed. I think it's the same example here. We got this right because they already took all the oil, took all the money, and then they left with the uh, pollution, which cost much more to clean than the uh, benefit that they come from, from mining. And then, uh, what to do? I think it's like clean up, and it takes so much time, and, and most importantly is uh, we need a vision, um, which probably started from, from the words that the landscape, do we give them some options, we give them some uh, possibility of the remedy that, that we talked about, and then we need some kind of this wake up calls that, that happen in, in uh, Tar Creek mm -hmm. for, for people to start thinking, for politics, for policy makers to start thinking and, and to produce some acts and to give some super fund to, to, to um, clean up these you know, problems. So, well, I think we have a small work to do, and uh, we know it's important. We don't know how long it will take. But anyway, thank you for your information and uh, some of the hopes that 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 uh, you give us. Uh, thank you for thank you for your comments. There is of course a very small conceit that I was playing uh, when I you know I title the studios. Uh, I don't title them arbitrary. I tell you know remade. I use almost you know remade this room. Right? But it, remade isn't just about working on land. Remade is actually about remaking you. The individual, as, as a designer, you have to change, you have to expand. And also, uh, the second is remaking the profession, remaking the field. And so, uh, my intention is that these three levels yes, the land, landscape, yes, the field, and discipline, but actually also about uh, you, remaking you as a different type of designer, a different person. 
Tar Creek was the second Superfund site in the United States. The first one was Love Canal in New York State. Love Canal was cleaned up and it's now re-inhabited. Tar Creek is still as polluted as it was in 1970-1980. And the tragedy is, of course, because of the tribal connection. But I'm given great hope that the work of Rebecca Jim and others you know, will carry on there. And I said I started, actually I worked, started working on this in 1999 and not 2001. And there, and this will tell you how the field has changed, the, the focus at Harvard was not through the design school, it was actually from the School of Public Health and the Medical School with Howard Hu and Jack Spangler. And I was brought in because I seem to know something about plants and I could do certain things. And so, that, so I came in almost like an outsider. And then I, I'm working on it, uh, not, not progressively, yeah, every time I can go in and out on that. But um, I will be uh, talking to the, the Rebecca, Jim, and others in, in about a month's time. And I'll keep working on it kind of forever. Um, but the intention with the students is to remake the student. And remember, um, there was a, a profession called sanitary engineering. And it, it, it sounds as though the person does your plumbing your toilet, you know. And they were really smart as a profession, you know, in the 1970s. Sanitary engineering. Oh, yeah, the plumber. They were very smart. They changed their name. They called themselves environmental engineers. And of course, everyone now knows environmental engineering. This is very serious. They're kind of coming together with both policy, science, and applied engineering on site. Um, the one thing, and I work with uh, Kurt Franson on this site, who's a, a wonderful environmental engineer, uh, trained as a hydrologist. The one thing we do not have is a spatial vision. They're very good on the, the technical aspects of doing the bits. And I've actually become an amateur environmental engineer. I kind of, I no training in it. I just have picked it up as I go along. And when this was introduced into the design school at Harvard, I had to fight. It was, I was told, this is not landscape architecture. Why are you doing this? This is engineering. And I said, I, I, dis I disagree. And I kind of push back and push back. And now, if you look at, for example, the ASLA, American Society of Landscape Architects, or the equivalent in, in Thailand, every second project that wins awards is dealing with a site like this or uh, similar. And it's now become so central in the field that people don't even talk about it anymore. It's kind of accepted. From Fresh Skills Landfill in, in Staten Island, New York, to um, you know, projects in, in military bases in Yongsan and Korea, and you know the, the, the DMZ and things like that, it's almost accepted that you're dealing with that. And, and I watch this struggle and be part of it going through. And so I urge all of you all the students, you know, to find the place. And I said it way at the beginning, this is a salon de refuse, the idea of the place that, you know, where the, re the rejected landscapes. And it's a place I landed and the place I've kind of been for 30 something years. And it's a great place to be. It's sometimes lonely. <laughs> it's sometimes, it's not, and now, you know, with Julian Bardman, with we have Margaret in Toronto, you know, and Peter Lotz in Germany. There's a whole a great, great group of landscape architects. Ken Smith does a bit of work in that, Martha Schwartz a little bit. And then, of course, all the other firms. But find where your place is. Find where you can intervene and remake yourself, the field, and the landscape that you engage in. It doesn't have to be this. It can be any number of things. There's climate adaptation to work on. There's issues of equity. You can work on just to start, and public health, children. You find where your place is and go into it and take it over. Okay. I'll hold you to that. Okay. I'll come back in 10, 15 years. I want you to see to see you doing that. Okay.
Thank you. Yep, one more question. As the mic is in oh. my hand, so okay. I will start the question first. Oh, sorry for having my mic in hand first. Um, I thank you for your lecture. I think what you just answered to us um, that the remaking of on the site, but the name of the remaking is not just on the site, but also for the for for our profession or other design profession as well. Is that we are not only really care about aesthetic anymore. We also can uh, push uh, our boundaries of um, advocating in, in other areas as well. I think in this sense, we we need a wider um, base of knowledge in order to be able to discuss about politics, discuss about um, what what are underneath the grounds, what what are the toxic um, mm -hmm. that has been contaminated lands. Um, as you can see that um, in your studio, you maybe uh, provide five weeks for some understanding on that context and their origins. Um, can, is it possible for you to share to us um, what are the process, what are the blood and tears that JSD students have to get through in order to um, get those knowledge and really yeah. be able to to um, build the design as yeah. solutions on yeah. science or other knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because I can see that there are not only options on so solutions on um, science about the soil, but also environmental justice, um, changing of the laws. Um, mm -hmm. that, that would be my question. Yeah, I've got a blood, sweat, and tears. Is the three parts. Um, very quickly, because it's Time is short. I would say that no one has adequate information. You know, I mean, they're, they're deficient in many areas. But landscape architects have to learn about vegetation, they have to learn about soils, they have to learn about hydrology. And it doesn't take much to introduce into these subtopics the questions related to pollution and contamination. It, it actually is very simple. You can talk about soils, composition of soils, and you can also talk about heavy soils. And so you'll find that that's now, first of all, I've written a lot about this stuff, and so you can read the books and the articles. But I think now, it's actually in the GSD, it's embedded in the core teaching. The studios they do before mine, the core introductory. Now, they don't have studio that just says we're going to learn about pollution, but the sites there, they start off very, very um, easily. They start off looking at the, the, the very straightforward forming and shaping of landscapes on sites that are, let's call it benign. And in the third semester, uh, actually the second semester, they start to see a polluted river for the first time. But that's the second semester. Um, and then in the third semester, you do a site on a landfill, and so very slowly they're actually getting, gaining this knowledge. They also, as students, all the students of the GSD are graduate. We have no undergrads, okay? So they come from, in some cases, from art practice, but they also come from science. So you find that everyone is deficient in something. In other words, the scientists are deficient in artistic production. The arts artists are deficient in the kind of true science. And what each of them does is teach the other. The way the studios are set up is they teach each other. And they're not experts by the end, but they have whole careers in front of them. So I would suggest it's embedded in the core teaching, but then people come in with interest. For example, if you understand how a tree works and functions, and I'm taking uh, moisture and nutrients. In 10 minutes, I can tweak it and show you how it takes up pollution called phytotechnology. And I wrote a book on this. So it, it's just a matter of taking existing knowledge. That was my question what core knowledge do you need? And just tweaking it one part so you can understand it. Everyone is missing some of the information. But that's okay because you've got a whole 30, 40, 50 years ahead of you. Okay? And the other thing is you learn by trial and error. 
Um, I just learned by reading a lot, by being an amateur. One thing I do is I, I, in the earlier period, I didn't hang out with landscape architects. I hang out with engineers and scientists. And I'd ask them questions all the time. How do you do this? How do you clean the water up? And they, they go into incredible detail because they love to talk about their work. What is interesting, if you look up on the internet, Cheryl Rain, C-H-E-R-Y-L, Rain, R-U-A-N-E. She was one of my students after college. No, she's before college. So, um, Cheryl Rain is a landscape, who did undergraduate landscape architecture at UMass Amherst. So she has a BLA. She came to us for an MLA. Okay, that, that's not unusual. But she graduated, and she wanted to do a type of practice that was slightly different. So this is the early 2000s. So she actually, after doing my brownfield course, this kind of remade site, she entered something called Weston and Samson, which is a, a very solid, traditional environmental engineering firm of 2,000 people. And there's one landscape architect. She'd get into it. And she, I mean, people said, her, Carl Steinitz says, what the hell are you doing going in with 2,000 engineers? You're going to be stuck in a corner over there. What she did, she was able, very slowly, in their project, they brought in big projects, waterfront projects, wastewater treatment plants, restorations of rivers, and they say, oh, you're a landscape artist. Can you tell us how we can do the slope here? What kind of plants should we do? And so she started to be into the project. Fast forward five, five years ago. She now runs a 25-person landscape design office embedded in Weston and Samson. And they are now the lead designers. They bring in the projects they then give to the engineers to help. Park restoration, waterfront. So they are they flipped the model. They use the frankly the basis of the traditional environmental engineering firm. You know, they can deliver, they do all the math, they do all the science, but they are now sub consultants to their landscape office inside West and Samson, which are now winning national awards. And so she, Cheryl is, is a, a very interesting study because she's been able to really very slowly work her way in that she actually, she's very personable so she can work with the engineers but she also showed a lot of architects point of view and now they are the lead consultants of Western Samson. Now it also helps that Cheryl is, is a kind of slightly larger than life character. She plays semi-pro ice hockey, okay? She's a goalie. She also does uh, rowing. She single skulls on the Charles. I mean, she, she's fairly, not quite Olympic, but she's fairly kind of, and she's a big um, And so she's just, she's slightly larger than life. But I like her narrative, I like her story, because she was, again, able to see an opportunity. She started small and just kept working away and now all the engineers can come to her and say, how do we do this? How do we do this? And then they can work out the numbers. They can do the formulas. But she has the vision. And that's what the client wants. He wants the vision. It's a, a butterfly in Boston, work in New England, work in New York, etc. So maybe you, see, you can look her up on, on you know, Ruane, Western Samson. You'll see her. And uh, I think we have the last question. Oh, last question. Are you sure? Last one. Okay, uh, hello, Professor. Uh, firstly, very thank I'm very thankful that you come here and give me uh, the ses uh, this session. Uh, my question may be not directly relates to our landscape professional in a way, but. Uh, in your presentation, you use the opening and the closing quotes from Dante, and also you mentioned uh, many creators like Randall Burbies and uh, the Russian director, like 
I'm like just curious about uh, those those creative words. What what does what does those words affect our thought or affect your perceptions working in this landscape field? That that which include many scientific space that that you using in this project that you uh, presents us today. Okay, well, and why, why am I calling Dante and why am I calling Tarkovsky, yeah. you know? What does that have to do design? Because I'm not giving a lecture on film theory, and I'm not giving a lecture on, on uh, you know, poetry. Um, I think as an individual, as a designer, you have to be very broad. You have to take in influences. I just have to be absorbed and um, obsessed with Russian film from a certain period. Not because it's any, not because in fact I shouldn't even use the word Russian. It's just uh, Tarkovsky is a very particular type of filmmaker that I have studied a lot. I studied him in London uh, because he is able to imbue ordinary landscapes, or let's call them landscapes that are very disturbed, with a kind of poetic and visionary way of looking at them to bring out other themes in human life. He deals with kind of love, he deals with death, he deals with what is, um, what is grace, how does the human exist in society? And so I find on a, on a very, let's call it trivial level, his imagery is, is very beautiful. And if you watch any of these films, you can just watch these films and just look at the, the injury. But he's also making some very serious points about society. I mean, he wrote about this. Um, I'm also a slight of a kind of a buff on, on history on, of film. The film, the cinematographer for that film is the same cinematographer that Ignar Bergman used. And so the, the, these are just things you don't need to know. But I'm kind of interested in how things are sort of set up. And with Dante, um, I just like the purity of the poetry. I like the idea of the descent. And of course, I'm playing a little joke on you. You know, the idea we're all going to go there together down into hell, and we're going to suffer down there, and then we're going to come back up. Um, and I think it's useful. I'm also very interested in the poetry of W.H. Auden. I mean, the portrait of Philip Market, the portrait of Robert Frost. My wife actually is a much more serious study of poetry, and, and um, uh, the poetry books in the house are from you know, her interests. Um, and I find that you, if you don't have to study Tarkovsky or poetry, you can study other things you're interested in. Um, so, seriously, it, it can come from any. I, I talked to Catherine Gustafson. You may you might know as a landscape architect based both in Seattle and Paris. Catherine Gustafson has a way of working landform that you might find interesting. Her folding, her princess died, sad and thing. Catherine Gustafson was originally trained as a, as a textile fashion designer. And so she sees landscape like cloth. And like the, the thing about a fashion designer, and I know some in my time, um, you know, it's about how you cut cloth, how you fold it, how you tuck it, how you stitch it. Uh, if you want to be extreme, you go to you know, the queen, you know, who, who sort of pushed one side of it, or you go to the more kind of, you know, Dior and things like that. But she talks about this, but she never makes an ex exact reference. She doesn't say, well, this project started from me looking at a dress by, you know, Dior or something. She just, I'm interested in how folds work. I'm interested in how you stitch things together. I'm interested in surface. And one of the things, if you actually have a friend who's a fashion designer, the one thing a fashion designer is, uh, is very good at, and I also tell my students in landscape architecture, they are, landscape architects are terribly imprecise. Imprecise about what it is they're doing, but imprecise 
and how they describe what it is the material they're using. But I kind of want the form to kind of, you know, do this. this um, the one thing about fashion designers is they're incredibly precise. This fall, I'm working with suede, mid length, um, black tones, and cut this way. <laughs> There's no, there's no, it's absolute, you know, in the spring I'm working with this, this and this. And they're trained that way to be that kind of precision. And I kind of like, and, and Gustafson is like that. She, she carries her, she was trained in Paris. And it's in the landscape. And I, if you talk, if you listen to her lectures, if she comes here, maybe, um, uh, she'll talk in that way. But she'll never actually say my references. But, so what I'm saying in, in a rambling long kind of way is find the passion that's interesting. Don't think because you have a topic over here that has nothing to do with, you know, that's that. My landscape is, is this. Fold it all together. And that's why I make my students watch Stalker. Or um, there's a mirror is another one. That he, he, I make them watch the movies. Um, not because they want to turn them into film critics or film buffs, but it actually helps them understand landscape and particularly change and time that he was very interested in. And Dante is just a, a little humorous thing I do. Okay. I think different designers have different sources of inspiration as well. And today we thank you a lot to Professor Kirkwood. And I hope these lectures will inspire all of us to look into landscape at a broader context. And uh, thank you, everyone. And this is Professor Liu Kirkwood. Oh, terrible.